hello everyone. I'm, I believe I'm going to get us started. So my fellow panelists, panelists uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, for those of you in who are joining us as kind of observers, I've put into the chat box the presentation links so you guys can view this presentation slide deck. We also be recording this presentation and putting it on our website along with the your survey feedback link and the kind of the complete guides and things of that nature. So everything will be kind of taken care of on that on our website, which we will link uh, throughout and at the end as well. So thank you all. Because we have a tight agenda for one hour, I'm gonna get us started or normally it might give us a couple more minutes. So this is the agenda for today. We are gonna be doing a background and overview of the model programs of study guide. We're gonna kind of quickly describe the process by which we created this map of uh, like the backwards mapping process of each guide. We're gonna discuss the role of the advisory committee that helped formulate these guides. And then we're gonna deep dive uh, briefly the content of each particular guide that you see here on your screen and some key takeaways for them. So the four programs of study that we are discussing today are arts and communication, architecture, construction, and energy, which we like to call ACE for short, AFNR, agriculture, food, and natural resources, and of course, finance and business services. At the end of the presentation, we're also gonna provide a link, once again, where all these guides exist, the recording will exist, and the process for public comment, which it will be running through June 5th. Uh, I wanna pause here for a second for to give a brief moment for kind of our colleagues at the Illinois Community College Board to comment and share their thoughts and welcome us all here today as well. Great, thank you so much, Juan Jose. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for taking the time out of this um, beautiful Friday morning to join us for a presentation. Um, my name is Natasha Allen and I'm the Senior Director for Career and Technical Education at the Illinois Community College Board. Um, unfortunately, my colleague um, Whitney Thompson is not able to join us today, but she just sent her, her um, warm regards. Um, so these model programs of study have been something that the field was requesting for quite a while. And it's something that um, at the ICCB we're really wanting to do as well. And then, so with the reauthoriz reauthorization of Perkins and the creation of the new Perkins five state plan um, that really provided the perfect catalyst for us to really um, do, uh, dive in deeply to this work. Um, so Perkins five, as I'm sure you're all familiar with at this point, really push states to enhance those transition points um, between secondary and post-secondary um, and throughout the student's entire career and really emphasizing those multiple entry and exit points. Um, and this is something I might argue is more crucial now than ever. And of course, I'm saying that through the COVID lens. Um, as we all know, COVID is probably going to affect our economy and our education and workforce systems um, for years to come. And so I really think that bearing down and doing this work now is especially important. So um, we wanna thank our, our colleagues from Ed System Center for being so diligent and doing such great work on the second round of model programs of study. And so with that, I don't wanna take up any more of the time. So I'll hand it back over to Juan Jose. Thank you very much, Natasha. So that's, uh, I really appreciate that. So we're gonna keep going. Uh, I do want to give a moment to uh, allow my panelists to introduce themselves before and kind of, will, and I think John, if you can give a brief overview of Education Systems Center. Uh, so my name is Juan Jose Gonzalez. I'm the Pathways Director for Education Systems Center. Why don't I go over to Emily, then Sarah. Morning, everyone. My name is Emily Rust. I'm Director of State Policy and Strategy at Ed Systems and looking forward to talking to you all about ag, food, and natural resources in a bit. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Clark, External Relations Manager at Ed Systems, and I'll be helping in the chat. Let's go Heather and then John. Hi everyone, Heather Penzak, Policy and Program Manager with Ed Systems. You might have seen me on the first round with the Education Model Program of Study and excited to be here for Arts and Communications. 
Hi, everyone. I'm John Furr. I'm, I'm the Executive Director for uh, Ed, Ed Systems. We're really thrilled to have you on the webinar with us today and really excited to speak with you about the model programs of study work. Um, Education Systems Center does significant amount of work with our state agency partners and issues of college and career pathways and high school to college transition work, as well as data related work. And all that work has kind of come together in, this, in the efforts around the model programs of study. We're also we are also actively working with communities throughout throughout the state of Illinois on the implementation of high quality pathway systems and certainly the resources that have come through the model programs of study are really key to those local efforts to put in place these systems from secondary to post-secondary. So again, we appreciate you uh, being here on, on the webinar with us and we'll look forward to your public comment on the model programs of study. Back to you, Monose. Great, I think the next is yours. The next sections are yours, John. Well, thank you. Uh, so with that, just in terms of a little bit of the why behind the model program study. So the goals from kind of developing these processes, and again, we've been engaged in this work with the first round for models programs of study that we began uh, toward the beginning of last year on through the second round is really tied into the state's Perkins 5 plan. And the goal for the models is that we'll provide guidance and uh, uh, exemplars for local programs to be able to adopt or to customize as they're working for putting in place programs to study for uh, approval as part of the state's Perkins 5 plan. Uh, we also view that these models can help to provide a framework for state agencies as they're looking at different ways for program supports. So as states are looking at courses that they might want to focus on for articulation or curriculum resources, or some of the work-based learning models that the goals that those can tie in directly to model programs to study framework that have been developed through this, through this area. And particularly for dual credit courses. So the state has had a number of policy uh, uh, focus areas for scaling dual credit. And the one, one of the key aspects of model programs of study as Juan Jose will kind of walk through is being able to backwards map what are those strategic dual credit courses that need to be in place across the different program areas. And that can help to inform again, what do we need to make sure is available throughout the state and that can be um, uh, um, articulated across various colleges for this work. And lastly, you know, making sure that through the model program of study that they are tied into competencies while we are focusing on course titles. As you can see, as we talk through this, you'll see that there is that deep dive into the competencies that should be part of, should be part of those courses that are tied into what students need to be able to know and to be able to do for the future of work in that particular area. This is also tied into, although we've talked about the state's Perkins 5 plan, there are a number of other policy connections that the model programs of study are also related to. Uh, one of the foundations that we'll talk about is the Post-Secondary and Workforce Readiness Act, which helps to kind of establish the new statewide system for college and career pathway endorsements, which is very much part of the model programs of study structure and sequence, as we'll talk through. As we've already discussed as well, there's a key tie-in to the state's work on scaling dual credit. And some of the model programs of study, even as we're getting to policy issues on the teacher shortage, the, the education pathway model developed as part of the first round is tied directly to that. Also, as districts are beginning to implement uh, the college and career readiness indicator under the state's ESSA plan, there's also a connection point to many aspects of the model programs of study in terms of the dual credit coursework, in terms of the work-based learning aspects, and also the program of study completion components that are tied in to the College of Careers Indicator. And last but not least, as the state is looking at its economic development priorities, and clearly this work ties in as well as, as Natasha had pointed out to the state's needs as we're looking at the um, recovery processes from COVID-19 and beyond. So there are, if you, if you go on the website and click on the link, there are four guides which have been finalized and published, and those are uh, shown there on the website as one as they pulls those up. So those guides have fully gone through earlier in the year, uh, the complete public comment and review process and are considered finalized. And we have the four new guides that are here today. So again, really excited for the public release of these. They're all labeled draft. Uh, so these are being put out again for response and public comment. And as we receive the public comment through this period, we'll take that and we'll incorporate those and be able to look to finalize those within, within, within the next few months. Uh, but across these, these eight guides really cover and incorporate all the various career clusters that are part of this Perkins 5 program study areas. So those are incorporated across the eight different guides, which are shown here. And with the role of advisory committee, as we were developing these guides within each of these areas, we pulled together a group of between 20 to 30 folks that cut across secondary and post-secondary and employer groups 
and other stakeholders within these fields to make sure that we're really hearing from the field about are there different trends that are happening in the industry area that we, we aren't getting from labor market information uh, that's being pulled and analyzed in part of this project to make sure that we are understanding beyond that, I mean, what are the credentials and degrees which might not currently be in place at a number of colleges we're starting to emerge, making sure that that's being pulled in, ensuring that as we're doing this extensive on the ground, as we're doing this extensive desk analysis that is tied into what practitioners are seeing in the on the ground work and thinking about, you know, what is the future of work in these various sectors? Where are the jobs that are being automated? Where do we see growth in the future? Making sure that that's being pulled into the analysis. And the advisory committees were brought in at uh, various key touch points around designing the pathways maps, around determining what are the most strategic early college credit courses that should be embedded within this work, and thinking about the key competencies that are part of this work as well. Um, we do have one question that's in the chat that I'll, that I'll address before turning over one to Zay about, you know, will the guides be pulling additional content areas like fine arts into Perkins qualification to be eligible for Perkins funding? I would say that the maps themselves in some, in some areas do be, go beyond what has traditionally been a part of Perkins funded programs of study. We felt that it was important to be inclusive of all the various post-secondary pathways and the various industry areas that we are providing. But there are certain places, particularly with the arts and communication, where some of those pathways are not necessarily Perkins pathways per se, but we think should be thought of as part of a robust local pathways, uh, part of a robust local pathways process that can incorporate both Perkins funded programs of study and perhaps some other locally funded programs of study. So thank you for that question, Jenny. And with that one, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you, John. So everyone, uh, what you're seeing here on the screen is kind of what we've uh, added systems like to say, kind of a coalescing state pathways model, right? There's a lot of uh, programs of study being implemented locally, a lot of words like pathways being kind of thrown around, but, and there's a lot of variance from region to region across the state, but we're starting to see among state agencies, among kind of uh, stakeholders at the secondary and post-secondary level, there seems to be this coalescing around this framework of, of a pathway, right? Which is Pathway includes some individualized student planning, a unique focus on career-focused coursework, which can mean CT instruction, funded instruction, but also can include other courses that are not normally uh, kind of traditionally included in that. Obviously, with many pathways in career-focused education, there has to be an emphasis on work-based learning and activities. But in our programs of study, and in increasingly so, there's a there's attention paid to core academic subject areas, so English and math, but also you know maybe science and social science, and how those complement the career focused instruction. As a student, you know, in the, the state's framework, kind of starts to move from instead of just a secondary program study or pathway, and in just a uniquely post secondary pathway, we really are starting to create a secondary to and through post secondary pathway, right, where students are having off ropes on ramps, as Natasha mentioned. They're accessing higher skilled jobs as they go along. They're accessing higher degrees and higher kind of labor market outcomes as well. I also wanna make note that in the last, you know, as John mentioned with the Post-Secondary Workforce and Readiness Act, there has been the inclusion now, the creation of a college and career pathway endorsement, right? This is different than, you know, a label like CT concentrator. This is a, a marking that a student can earn on their high school transcript and on their high school diploma that shows they have, they have a multi-year set of experiences and expertise in a certain industry sector and were participating and completed various requirements to earn an endorsement on a pathway. Very similar at the high school level to perhaps like the state syllabi literacy or, you know, almost like a high, like a college level minor, right? And something that they've done over multiple years and multiple sets of experiences. That pathway endorsement did influence kind of how we created that path, uh, our model programs of study and how we tried to kind of align to the dual credit and transitional instruction requirements of the college career pathway endorsement. What you're seeing here on your screen is kind of our pathways mapping process. Um, well, I'll trust my colleagues in the systems if I need to pause to answer a question immediately, but there's gonna be stuff coming in, but we will kind of answer those typing or kind of uh, live as well. So there is a kind of pathways mapping process and you know we do want to kind of we're going to highlight how we went through each of these sequences uh, in the next couple of slides, you know, but we started our process or model program study guide with identifying what we called high priority occupations right essentially we use labor market data the permanent labor data 
but also MIT's living wage calculator. And we try to determine which roles in a certain industry sector had the opportunity for a positive growth outlook over the next 10 years, and which of those occupations also had salaries high at or near or higher than the living wage for one adult, one child for the state of Illinois, right? So, you know, our labor market information came from the Career One Stop or U.S. Department of Labor webpage, but also the Illinois Department of Economic Employment Security, IDES. Our living wage calculation that we use in terms of determining what roles we wanted to benchmark to was based on the limit, uh, MIT's living wage calculator. There's a link here for you all to kind of click on, explore that living wage calculator as well. You know, we really tried to set a, a benchmark of like 26 dollars. Like, uh, at around like $22.33 an hour. So and, and any, any we wanted a benchmark to any row that had at its median an earning of $22 or over <clears throat> for our pathways development. I'll give you an example of how this plays out in our research. As you see here, kind of this is like the, labor, uh, the, the primary labor information for medical assistance, as you can see here on the left-hand side, the primary labor provides over the next 10 year period, what is the percent increase in that role? And it's a very, and that's a net positive opportunity, the annual job openings, but also we paid attention to what is the typical education needed to get started in that role? And how would that align to kind of the degrees and credentials we wanted to benchmark to? And of course we paid attention to the median salary for that role in order to kind of make decision points about its inclusion in our program of study guides, and you'll see this play out more as well. And, you know, and this is kind of the bar for the living wage criteria that we mentioned earlier as well. The next part of our process was determining the promising credentials now that we had identified a set of high priority occupations for each sector. Right, And what we define a promising credential is, is a degree or college certificate that immediately prepares students to enter into a high priority occupation. Right, And then we had a focus on credentials typically available in various Illinois community colleges. Uh, some credentials or some degrees weren't placing into high priority occupations immediately, but we saw that there was a progression where someone could kind of earn a certain degree of credential and then have that stack towards a future uh, promising credential or in future access to a higher priority occupation. A classic example of this is like certified nursing assistant, right, where the wage and kind of, although the growth of that occupation is high, the wage is pretty low, but that is kind of a prerequisite requirement for a practical nurse or a registered nurse, which have higher kind of wages with whether we were aiming for. So this is just an example of how we kind of determined of the community college degrees that we wanted to target as well for our kind of our mapping process. Once we have determined the high-priority occupations and the promising credentials, we really set forth in kind of identifying strategic community college courses that we're building to those degrees and occupations. So, for example, once we had the promising credential requirements, we really looked at what were the courses that were requirements for those degree programs or those credentials, right? And we tallied and labeled all of those career courses and general education courses to see which one of them were most common for the you know, various programs in an industry sector. We then also kind of took the opportunity and time to try to determine which of those courses were likely accessible for dual credit, either you know, by accessible in the sense that a teacher could be credentialed to offer those courses as dual credit at a local high school, or you know, though that course was likely to be have a easier a student eligibility to access that course, meaning the, the requirements of prerequisites or math and English placement were not so onerous that students were able to access either for dual credit or dual enrollment as well. We paid attention of these kind of strategic community college courses, which ones also were transferable or had currency or kind of could be portable among various industry uh, community colleges or had an overlap with industry credentials as well. Once we've kind of done a lot of that desk research and kind of were informed by the, you know, the advisory committee about what is like the right trajectory, what are the right courses, the right labor market outcomes, the right degrees we should be paying attention. We then set forth to try to map a secondary to post-secondary course sequence that started in high school and went through at minimally at least the first year of college with a kind of the potential for branching off and specialization in various kind of degree programs as well. So we, we wanted to make sure that our program of study kind of offered the opportunity for students to graduate high school with at least six hours of early college credit, whether that be AP or dual credit. 
This aligns with the college career pathway endorsement that I mentioned earlier. So we really, we felt that students should start early college coursework no later than their junior year of high school. Right. And then we consider the typical student schedule and the uh, typical high school kind of processes for scheduling students. We also kept open the possibility in certain industry sectors that in addition to coursework, work based learning opportunities or capstone experiences would be really, really valuable for our students. We wanted to make sure to add some flexibility. And in certain of the guides, we make reference to those as a part of our kind of suggestions and incorporation. We also made uh, recommendations to courses beyond the career focused courses, meaning we made recommendations in science, social science, math, and English, and how those kind of courses could either be for early college or AP to complement the career focused courses as well. Lastly, as a part of our process, we went on to define technical competencies uh, in some cases for the entire kind of pathway program of study at the bridge between high school and community college. And this was done for the AFNR kind of subject areas which my colleague will show. But we also defined technical competencies for specific dual credit courses, right? These were courses that were already not transferable. And, but we felt that they were common enough among various community college programs across various community colleges that some kind of set of common set of competencies for these courses might increase the likelihood of potential portability and kind of transferability down the line in the future. I'll pause there to kind of look at questions and chats. Uh, I don't know if there's something I should be addressing. I, let me know. One thing I'll just note, if folks can direct your questions to the Q&A function, it makes it a lot easier for us to keep track of them as opposed to in the chat where there's a little bit of limitation around who's able to see what. Um, Uh, Warren, in terms of how does Illinois living wage compare to adjoining states? So obviously, I think the living the Illinois living wage is going to be higher than our than our colleagues in you know Indiana, Wisconsin. I'm not certain, maybe Iowa, but I'm not certain about any additional states. What I will say, Warren, that there was a recent uptick in the living wage calculation this calendar year. But when we did all our research, it was benchmarked on 2020 kind of calculation. So we make note of that in a footnote in our guide. It just goes to show you that the cost of living in Illinois is steadily increasing and just recently had a significant jump upwards. Yeah, we're higher than all of our adjoining states. Um, Wisconsin's the closest. It's only like a dollar behind, um, but, but uh, Indiana's a few dollars behind Illinois and Iowa as well, and Missouri as well. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Heather, to talk a little bit about the first kind of guide in arts and communications. Hi everyone, thanks Juan Jose. So um, I think back here to start this out to one of the comments from our advisory committee members on one of the first meetings that the path of an artist is circuitous and winding. And so I think you can see a lot of that reflected here and just the different ways um, that you might pursue a career as an artist and what that looks like in all the different industries. So I think this might be one of our busiest maps. I know Sarah, who helped design these maps, was like, all right, Heather, at some point, like we're going to have to really think about what we're adding here. Um, but wanted to capture, again, to the points raised earlier, all the different paths and all the different options and the ways that you might combine programs and study even um, to pursue a career in the arts. So you can see especially like in the post-secondary options. Um, we have this added thing in this program of study where there are interdisciplinary studies called out. And so I think it's really exciting too, as we have all these different programs of study built out, you can incorporate those and talk about those as you're also talking about this program of study with students as they're planning their path. Um, but we also have here electives that are specifically called out as well for the pathway that aligned to the other programs of study like in business and education um, to really thinking through, again, that interdisciplinary pathway and starting that within the high school space for students. And yep, you can move it. Um, so if you look at this chart of our selected occupations, wages and job growth, um, we definitely have occupations on here that don't meet that living wage or, or don't meet that growth in Illinois criteria. Um, but at the same time, these are occupations that are highly sought after by students. They're really interested in pursuing these. And so want to include them here to make sure that we're having really robust conversations with students and thinking through, okay, maybe this 
says no here, but that also is dependent on the type of work you're able to secure, the consistency of that work, whether you're doing an interdisciplinary study to make that now a living wage career. Um, so I think, you know, even personally being married to an artist, like there is money to be made in the industry. And I think often students are told there isn't. And this kind of helps give that um, full picture of what it means to be in the arts and communications industry and what that can look like. And so looking at the post-secondary options here, um, you can see kind of more clearly from this chart that we have kind of three paths within this program of study in fine arts and design, performing arts, and in mass media and communication. And so these track then into different associates of fine arts, associates degrees, um, and leading up into those bachelor of arts. Um, and again, the interdisciplinary studies that are called out within there, you can see there's a lot of common studies included within each pathway as we worked with our advisory committee that did tend to bubble up a lot, right? In the fine arts and in performing arts, there's a lot of opportunities to be in nonprofit management, business management, marketing, definitely entrepreneurship is something that's called out within here and also the role within education within any of these pathways as well. And looking here to dive in from those career focused courses going from orientation all the way through your post-secondary courses that are recommended. Um, again, we have this path here, performing arts that isn't you know, a CTE course, but is something or a CTE pathway, but very much is something that students are interested in pursuing. Um, I would say here, there's probably even more that you could put here if you really wanted to put in music and dance um, and all those different pieces, but kind of thinking some through some of those IAI, common dual credit courses. Um, there's a focus here on kind of having your introduction to performing arts, which isn't necessarily a, a defined course, but something where you would think about showing those different occupations within this pathway to students, engaging them in some career exploration experiences where they're hearing from different um, uh, people in that career, right? And they can start to make a decision for themselves how they wanna pursue that pathway. And that's true for fine arts and also for mass media and communication as well really having this piece with an orientation and introduction where you're talking about all the different options within that pathway. Um, and then moving through, going into some introductory courses. So in fine arts and design, you can see there's kind of these sub pathways almost where you're having your drawing and your, your 2D design, um, or you're also looking at that intro to digital design and, and thinking through also the communications piece of this, if you have an interest in fine arts and design. Um, we have spelled out competencies for the intro to digital design course within fine arts um, and also in that capstone for mass media and communication, we have spelled out some competencies for multimedia production. Again, tended to be common courses that are offered across the community college system. Um, I will add um, that some of the titles or names that we are using here might be different at your local community college. We gave a name that we felt either was representative or common or could be generally understood across the various community colleges. Thanks, Juan Jose. And so looking then here too, into kind of some of your core academic courses, um, the things that I would call out here is within social science, as it might be applicable, really using um, that student's career interest to think about how they can take an IAI, dual, an IAI recognized dual credit course in art, music, dance, or theater appreciation to satisfy that requirement or um, participating in AP art history. We've also called out within the English section here for students to take an oral communication course so that they're, they're gaining those skills and what it means to present and be able to speak out loud. Um, and then also again, those electives here where they would be maybe engaging in some courses related to business or education as they might be pursuing an interdisciplinary route. Um, and you can see too, we've really called out that introduction to website development and also entrepreneurship within electives, really thinking through again, um, the path of an artist typically involves being able to, you know, market yourself, brand yourself and create that. Um, so wanting to call those courses out here. And so I've discussed some of these, um, but really thinking through some key takeaways as you're diving in and you're looking into this program of study, it does go beyond, you know, what might be your traditional CTE courses, but again, want to recognize that whole breadth of options that a student might pursue within this program of study. Um, and if you're incorporating other programs of study, right, like business or education within that, um, those are addressing some of those more traditional CTE codes as well. 
really looking at, like I mentioned earlier, those orientation or introduction courses, um, recognizing the different occupations within that focused pathway that they might be in, but also really recognizing what those interdisciplinary options are and supporting students' individualized planning. If they did want to incorporate some of those other electives, um, we all know that scheduling can always be kind of a, a hiccup, maybe more of a, a strong barrier sometimes as we're thinking about these. Um, so starting that conversation early will help students plan accordingly. Um, mentioned earlier too, some of these occupations are not included that necessarily meet the criteria, but they are of high interest by students and therefore really important and valuable to have conversations about. Um, thinking through where they can complete that social science dual credit course in their career interest area. Um, and also want to call here, this was a big discussion, you know, at multiple moments from our advisory committee that experience within this program of study within the arts and communications field develops a lot of essential employability competencies that, you know, need to be recognized more and more in terms of how you can become a creative thinker, problem solve, especially as you even move into some of those capstone courses, your ability to work on a team and, and produce a cohesive message, a cohesive product. Right, so we really wanted to call that out and highlight that within the competency descriptions for the two courses that we identified those for. Um, and are, are looking forward to you all as you dive into this program of study, um, and especially those competency descriptions of are really capturing the spirit of those courses to prepare students for success in post-secondary. I don't know if I have any questions here so far, so I think- I believe, I believe that we have no specific questions on arts and communications. Um, so with that, I'm going to move us to the next subject, and which is architecture, construction, and energy, and my colleague, John Fur. Thanks, Juan Jose. So I have the uh, privilege and honor of being able to facilitate the work for architecture, construction, and energy, and developing the model programs of study for the set of sectors within this grouping. Uh, one of the exciting aspects of the work for this particular area was to be able to look at how, how do the energy related roles relate to more traditional architecture and construction roles. Uh, within this, we were able to define those foundational knowledge and skills that can be supportive for both construction trades and the energy technician roles, which we'll kind of talk about as we get into more of the jobs and the course sequences. One thing that I will also note is that um, while the um, um, Energy related roles that are shown here focus more on energy technicians and the energy management roles. We also talked about as a group that there are energy jobs in manufacturing, in the engineering profession, in business. So when you think about the energy related roles and green jobs, it's not only within this model programs of study area, but also does tie to those other model programs of studies that we've been developing for these other fields as well. So if, as we go to the next slide and begin to look at some of the occupations and jobs that we have looked at, uh, there are certainly a number of very well-paying jobs within this field that are also projected to have substantial growth. Uh, the only job that didn't meet the living wage threshold was for solar uh, um, photo, um, photovoltaic installers, but we went ahead and included that because it was very near that threshold and also there's substantial growth that's projected within the state over the next 10 years or so. Uh, you can see within the construction trades, generally paying very high median hourly wages. There is, uh, it is pointed out within the guide though, that there does need to be thought from a student perspective about the number of hours you can expect to work in different trades roles. And there may be some roles in the trades where you can expect that consistent workflow and expect you can begin to annualize that salary over, over a typical number of, of hours per year. There may be some other trades positions though, where there's not as much work that's available, which would limit the annual compensation within those fields. Um, you can also see from a number standpoint, as we think about green jobs and future jobs, I mean, I, I think people oftentimes think of the solar jobs and within wind turbines. There's actually a significant amount of jobs that are projected within the, within the HVAC and the uh, um, uh, refrigeration roles. You can see those job numbers where from, 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 from an um, um, energy efficiency standpoint, even more jobs that are expected than some of the uh, green and the renewable job standpoint as well. And one, one other area that oftentimes students might not be thinking about within this area for job growth are those construction management roles and the energy management roles. And those are areas that we talked about in mapped out pathways too, which are very well paying and growing jobs within the state. 
So as we begin to look at the post-secondary options here, you can see that one important post-secondary option within the construction fields are the trade apprenticeship routes, which were highlighted and showing, and we talked quite a bit about uh, the difference between some union trade, some union trade apprenticeship pathways, as well as, well as non-union pathways within these different fields. And looking at when we begin to look at the construction trades training that's outside of, of um, uh, union apprenticeships in the state, it's oftentimes for the uh, electrician's roles, the HVAC and refrigeration roles, some welding related careers as well that can cut across construction and, and manufacturing related trades. Um, from an energy technician standpoint, that those are typically going to be certification programs at the community college level, which can move on to AES programs and on to BS degrees. And again, we talked about the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration roles, the HVAC and, and R roles, uh, which again can at least start with the initial certificates and move on to AES and BS programs. Many of the positions in the third and fourth areas for architecture and surveying and the construction and the energy management roles, um, except for the architectural technology and CAD roles, which you can um, move into the workforce with the AES degrees. Most, most of those roles will require moving on to a bachelor's degree program. We've talked about within construction management, there may be some ability to get those initial entry level positions with the AES, but typically is if you're gonna want continued career advancement, you're gonna need to have a bachelor's degree for those construction management positions within this field. And so as we back map the, um, the post-secondary options to the secondary level, the focus in the coursework here was really being able to design a set of courses which can provide a fundamental set of business and construction related skills that can apply across multiple pathways within this area. And you can see within the career focused coursework that starts with the orientation courses of uh, providing that foundation with the computer applications for business and also the intro to technology trades and, and, and the engineering related fields. Again, providing students with an understanding of all the various pathways that are within these sectors and the options that they can be able to pursue. And then moving into skill development, really looking to have for almost all students having that foundation of construction trades one. And we recommend that if that can be combined with geometry, so you're actually applying the math at the same time you're learning construction skills, that is a best practice we're seeing in many districts that should be thought about within this space as well. But with that construction trades one class, Again, for all students that are within this pathway, even if they're moving on to those business and design roles, that they need that strong foundation in issues of construction in terms of safety and the design and construction process and measuring and scaling and other foundational concepts with a strong tie-in to essential employability competencies as well. Really being able to, uh, to learn those competencies and, and reinforce those competencies around communication and problem solving and reliability and accountability and adaptability and flexibility as well. Um, also looking at, again, the tie in to the construction management roles, being able to bring in the introduction to business courses as part of that work. And then moving on to the capstone gets into some of the specialization um, opportunities that are there for construction trades too, which is really, again, allowing students to pursue those advanced construction trade skills and thinking about those capstone courses that they would want to have that lead into trade apprenticeships or that can lead into those post-secondary programs. And one of the things as you look at the competencies within those construction trades two course that we mapped out, we really focus on making sure that some of the knowledge that's needed for those energy technician roles is embedded within that. So students have an understanding of the work, work at height requirements for solar and wind jobs and understand the connections between building envelopes and energy efficiency, but that is tied in. And so the next slide for the general, the general elective courses, um, you can also begin to see there's within the science classes, there's a focus on physics within that course sequence. We also heard about some emerging programs that have a survey of um, um, renewable energy, which we thought was a best practice, which we highlighted within the guide. And on the math standpoint, really thinking about the math that's needed for either a technical math uh, progression and some of the STEM math courses that are needed for those technical roles, or for those who may be looking to move on to construction management or the, um, architectural programs, really getting to uh, those advanced math courses while still in high school. So just the final takeaways from this sector. Um, and some of these I know that we've talked about, again, there's a number of growing jobs that pay well within these various fields. Uh, there's a lot of variance in terms of the education that's needed with many of the trades and technician roles that are acceptable, that, that are um, uh, accessible after high school or upon completion of a short-term post-secondary credential with other roles, as we've talked about, really requiring that progression on to a bachelor's degree. 
Uh, it's very important within this field for students that want to pursue the construction trades to understand the options as we talked about for union apprenticeships, non-union entry-level employment, and post-secondary options. And the guide really dives into as kind of a breakout section on that, kind of talking specifically about some of the consideration for union versus non-union pathways. And within high school, thinking about those foundation courses, as we talked about, addressing both those business and construction related skills and making sure that we're thinking as we're talking about green jobs, and we know that that's a hot topic, that actually what, uh, what ties in there are many of the foundational construction trades related skills that can help to lead students in to those growing number of green jobs that we expect to see within the, within the coming years. So with that, if there's no questions, I think we can move on to our next area. John, there is a, a question that our colleague Jane Ostergaard, uh, I believe from College of DuPage, had some a lot of comments about kind of the transfer of the AES in architecture to a bachelor's degree. We, yeah. I, we'd follow up, but she did have a very good question. I think that it's worth a, a quick discussion item about like, is there any way to encourage for universities to better evaluate uh, kind of community college work and that partnership, given your breadth of experience in from secondary to post-secondary kind of partnerships and streamlining, any, any comments or thoughts you might have on that? Yeah, no, I really appreciate that comment. And I think that's um, some of what we're trying to promote with these models and that we you know, encourage further conversation about is how do we create those clearer pathways with whether it's two plus two or even some three plus one programs or tying in between the community college and university partners, where there is a clear understanding of the work that's happened at the community college level, especially as we're expanding those pathways down to the secondary space as well. So I, I think that needs to be a continued focus for the entire state of Illinois system. And I think we'd welcome conversations and some, and some ideas on how to strengthen those connections. Uh, John, there was a comment about Casey Blickham about kind of the trade apprenticeships mostly coming beyond the age of 21. I believe that we had a source of the, a data point source that, in the guide that it has a footnote or as a call out. So right. uh, can you just confirm that? Yeah, so that, that is sourced from a really deep analysis about trade apprenticeships in the Chicago land area that talked that, that did look at the analysis and the data of that and said that most of the individuals who were entering into the trade apprenticeship unions are mostly beginning after age 21. Again, that's not saying they're excluded. So they can, the eligibility criteria does allow those who are 18 and meet the other criteria to move into the trade apprenticeship roles. But students, and this is really something that came out of the, out of the committee process is making sure that students in high school, if they are pursuing the trade apprenticeships need to strongly know about what are the entry requirements for those trade apprenticeships, what are the qualifications that they're gonna have to meet and are able to know that those are often highly competitive, right? And so they need to be able to assess both the options for trade, trade apprenticeships, as well as some non-union opportunities and the programs that are available in post-secondary as well. All right, thank you. Thank you. Next up, my colleague, Emily with uh, AFNR. Thanks Juan Jose. Um, hi everyone. I'm here to talk about ag food and natural resources. So. Um, one thing that I'll just note on the front end, one topic of conversation that we kept on coming around to back around to with the wonderful advisory committee that I had the privilege of working with was the fact that AFNR is one of those areas where things are changing really rapidly, much like John was just describing with uh, architecture, construction, and energy, where the state of AFNR as it is today and as it has been is not the same as it will be evolving into. We see a lot of different changes across different pathways within AFNR. So I'll just name that up front. Um, it was a really exciting area to dive into. And one of the things that I'll just kind of front load, front load as a takeaway is that there's a lot of overlap across different AFNR pathways. There's a lot of integration across pathways within AFNR. And while there are um, I think it's eight different pathways identified in the ISBCTE matrix. Part of the reason why we landed on two primary pathways in the secondary space in this model programs of study guide um, is because at the post-secondary level, there's a lot of overlap in some of those introductory courses, and it requires a lot of breadth of knowledge on the student's part and breadth of course taking on the early end for students as they progress. So we'll go ahead and dive into the occupation piece here. Um, and at the, the occupations in, in ag food and natural resources, there's, there are many that um, meet the uh, living wage threshold that we've discussed already today um, across a breadth of, of types of AFNR industries. These occupations, as always, are not meant to be 
a, a total sum of every single uh, occupation or opportunity opportunity with an AFNR, but some of the ones that popped out to us as we did the analysis of the labor market information. Many occupations in the ag, food, and natural resources space can be accessed even with a high school diploma, but what we heard from the advisory committee as well as from the labor market information is that often um, while you could potentially enter into some of these roles with, some, with a high school diploma, um, that actually more of the, the stronger opportunities in terms of wages and growth are accessed through an associate's degree. And and then with more scientific roles or higher level roles, a bachelor's degree. I mean, there are some guided transfer programs, and I'll speak in a second to a little bit more to the post-secondary programs. But, you know, again, while this doesn't convey the full breadth of AFNR occupations, we're somewhat limited by, by the coding and Department of Labor data. One thing I'll just note while we're here is that uh, roles like agricultural sales are actually us tying to technical sales roles that are articulated in Department of Labor data um, because there isn't a separate occupation code for agricultural sales, whereas we do know and heard very loud and clear from the employers on the the AFNR advisory committee that there are a lot of different types of roles where an employer would need, say, a sales skill set in terms of agricultural sales, but also the technical knowledge around um, and content knowledge around the products that they are looking to sell in the AFNR um, sector. So I'll just note that 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 was kind of attention that we had to hold. Um, but that what was exciting to see is that there are so many occupations that we can consider um, to present to young people and think about what they want for their future. So at the post-secondary level, what that means is how do we, you know, and how do we think about targeting post-secondary programs that were available across the, across a breadth of community colleges in our state in our system. Just like Juan Jose noted earlier, in some cases we are kind of collapsing different names into names that we attributed based on programmatic descriptions and course descriptions. So I'll just name that. But there are a wealth of programs at the post-secondary level, um, and we've broken it out into the, the, the pathways articulated here for a couple of reasons. One, as I noted, for some roles, you do need a bachelor's degree in order to kind of get into the higher level science roles in AFNR. And so that's why we wanted to specifically call out some of those guided transfer pathways that exist across a number of different community colleges. When we think about a generalist agribusiness pathway, that could be in terms of focusing on the business portion of, of agriculture, food and natural resources, or in the production side of things. Um, and so that's why we wanted to kind of convey some of that breadth. In horticulture and plant science, they start with a lot of the same courses, but ultimately uh, it is more specialized to kind of focus on plant and soil science versus horticulture. And then animal science at the post-secondary level does require some specialized courses to, to get into that, to animal husbandry and those types of roles as well. Um, the other thing that I'll note, the reason why we have kind of these hashed lines um, from the agribusiness and horticulture and plant science uh, A. AAS programs into the Bachelor of Arts or Sciences is to convey that while many roles do not require that you need to progress into a Bachelor of Arts or Sciences, that there are some one-off uh, partnerships and articulation agreements between community colleges and four-year institutions around certain ag pathways for students to be able to take that AAS degree, which in some cases maybe have, has historically been considered more of a terminal degree um, and actually articulated up into a bachelor's if that's what the, the individual wants to pursue. So at the yeah, go ahead. Before, before we move on, there's a question about the decision making process for excluding some AFNR areas. Sure, sure. So, do you see it here? Yeah, I do. Thank you for that. That's um, there are very good question, Jenny. So I'll speak to animal science specifically in terms of occupational data. The primary roles that emerge in terms of that meet our living wage criteria and um, the growth criteria that we that Juan Jose explained the rationale behind previously and John did as well were husbandry roles. So there weren't a ton of there wasn't a breadth of roles. Um, so that's part of why we kind of restricted you know where there where there weren't pathways with a breadth of roles that met the criteria um, in terms of wages and growth. We needed to refine in on sort of the highest opportunity. Um, roles. And certainly there are um, many emerging food science roles. Um, and we, as I said, you know, sort of the state of AFNR as it is currently and where we would like to see it go in terms of programs of study is a little bit um, hamstrung by, by what the data are, what data are available, right? And so we know that there are a lot of emerging roles in food 
food research and development, for example, but that that is not already evident in the way the occupational data. And so we have to kind of toe this line of what we know is going to grow based on data that are available and what we have heard anecdotally in the field and know that is emerging. If that hopefully that helps address that, but certainly welcome more um, comments through the public comment survey um, and you know all of that kind of feedback. There's a lot of tensions that we had to hold. So moving into the um, secondary level. So when we look at those post-secondary programs of study and we say, okay, these are the programs of study we are trying to target into to at the post-secondary level, what does that mean at the secondary level? Um, again, we recognize that there are many different pathways within AFNR, that the ISB-CTE matrix outlines a number of different pathways. The reason why we landed on two prim at the primarily at the secondary level is because the courses that we outline here are actually a lot of the introductory coursework at the post-secondary level, regardless of the specificity of the, the specialized pathway that a student might end up on at the post-secondary level. Um, and so across the board, this aligns with the CT program um, of study matrix, basic ag science and intro to the ag industry. We encourage offering uh, one or the other of these one of the messages from the Ag Food and Natural Resources Advisory Committee was that there is a need to attract students of a variety of interests into AFNR fields, and that that could be students who have an interest in business, that could be students who have an interest in educating, becoming teachers, that could be students who have an interest in science, that there's really kind of something for everyone in AFNR. And so each of these courses kind of hits at a little bit of a different angle within the ag industry. So we wanted to highlight that. Um, when you get into more of the when you get into more of the specialized skill development and capstone courses, what we're seeing is in, you know, when we're talking about this agribusiness generalist pathway, um, while at the post-secondary level, it's really common to see the IAI course, Intro, Introductory Economics of Food, Fiber, and Natural Resources, that that might be difficult to deliver as an IAI dual credit course. And so that's how we landed on the Agricultural Business Management course, which aligns with the ISB is uh, matrix for the program of study um, and also aligns content wise with a lot of what's covered in that intro course at the in the IAI um, in that IAI vein. As you'll see here, there's a lot of courses that are IAI um, and so it, within AFNR um, and so to the degree possible, we definitely encourage secondary institutions to try to get dual credit partnerships um, to be able to offer them as dual credit and particularly IAI dual credit, which will open many more doors at the post-secondary level, both in community college and um, at potentially beyond if a student wants to articulate beyond that. Um, but really what we're, what we're saying here, as you can kind of see here, is in the skill development phase, it's still a little bit more generalist and then specializing as a student goes through. So at the capstone level, if a student who is in the agribusiness pathway wants to dive more deeply into animal science or soil science, they can. Um, at the in the horticulture and plant science bucket, if they want to focus on soil science or dive into crop and plant science, that they can specialize in that way. Um, and then, you know, progressing into the post-secondary level, there are general computer skills that that are common across different. Um, it's not an IAI course, but it was a common was a common course across community college programs. There are other pro, uh, courses in those program sequences that that are valuable to take. And then when we talk about sort of more of the gen ed courses or just so the, the rest of the students time, um, and we can go ahead and advance to the next slide. I don't know if it's just, there we go. Cool, thanks. Um, you know, when we think about the overall course sequence, generally it's it's following a, a, a typical social science sequence and science sequence, et cetera. What's valuable for students in AFNR fields would be to cover biology. And if possible, getting that in a dual credit or AP course um, that can articulate up in the post-secondary experience that that can be a valuable course to try to tackle at a secondary level. Economics comes up often in post-secondary programs. So to the degree possible offering microeconomics, which can help us sort of sales components and the skill, the skill set around agribusiness generally. Um, and then in terms of math, it's really just gen ed math um, for AFNR, most AFNR pathways. Certainly there are some specialized pathways that would require higher levels of math, but most programs require gen ed math or statistics at the post-secondary level. So we wanted to focus that, um, that focus that focus in on that there. Um, believe it or not, English communication is a huge huge set of courses at the early in the early stages of post-secondary um, across AFNR fields. So both written and oral communication are valuable courses to make sure students are prepared to enroll in credit-bearing coursework at the post-secondary level. 
And then the last thing that I have to share is that um, in addition to mapping the competencies for the strategic dual credit course in agriculture business management, um, we also had the task of mapping out the endorsement area competencies. These had not yet been developed. And so we landed on those that are on this slide here and welcome feedback on those through the public comment survey as well. Um, but we really wanted to, to, to identify what are those competencies that are essential across AFNR pathways. This is not meant to say only agribusiness pathway or only horticulture and plant science. This is really meant to be across AFNR pathways within that endorsement area. And as you can see here, there's a lot of emphasis on the integration across the systems, um, how those systems integrate with society as a whole, what that means in terms of being innovative and adaptive, et cetera. So, um, that was just one thing I just wanted to highlight through this. I won't walk through each of these. Um, and the final note that I'll just make is that one of the things that I didn't note in the course progressions is that something that the advisory committee discussed a bit of is how to offer contextualized learning. So uh, thinking about much like geometry and construction, there are some emerging models for offering courses that would count both as a science credit for high school graduation and could be contextualized with agricultural content. So those are so there are some emerging models that are noted in the narrative for that as well. Um, so the key takeaways we have, you know, again, there's a lot of occupations that can be reached through an associate's degree, that there's a real breadth of these occupations and sectors. And, and so thinking broadly about what kinds of students might be interested based on their interest in sales or working with people or working with products, um, business, business interests, et cetera. How can we kind of cross pollinate those interests and in order to attract them into these emerging AFNR occupations? Um, that there are a lot of common courses in the initial outset of post-secondary programs. And so it's important to be able to think about how do we strategically offer those at the secondary level to better, um, to better smooth that, that transition into post-secondary. Um, and that we can really focus in on core courses that are not already IAI. There's so many IAI courses in AFNR. So how do we actually think about other courses that are strategic like agriculture business management? Um, and I'm trying to see what questions I'll take a you might I have. have a yeah. I'll take a moment to answer, Dean, uh, your question. In regards to, uh, I think I'm understanding your, your question as, could the AI like that in manufacturing, engineering, technology, and trade, that that was split into two programs of study were manufacturing and pre-engineering and then uh, architecture, construction, and trades. I think that that was kind of some guidance that we received from the Illinois Community College Board and ISBE who were kind of jointly kind of thinking about creating these uh, model programs of study, either for their specific particular space. I would also argue that the advisory committee didn't uh, kind of die on that hill of splitting AFNR into two separate programs of study, but that's something that we could follow up with you for sure as well. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll move us along to finance and business services. I would just give everyone a heads up that we're three minutes from closing time. I'll likely kind of go into three minutes beyond the kind of 12 o'clock mark. But once again, this will be recorded and will be available for those who are interested on our website. So in the finance and business services, you see here kind of the uh, model program of study. It's a little more kind of traditional relative to the three others that you saw here today. But let me kind of dive into some of the roles and occupations, right? So first off in the finance and business services, one of the big things that we saw is that a lot of the higher paying or kind of typically higher paying roles in business do involve a bachelor's degree and some sort of kind of guided transfer to a bachelor's degree program. That being said, there were an increasing amount of roles at the AAS level that were kind of leading to placement in regional occupations and regional kind of living wage uh, um, situations. So that was something that we definitely wanted to kind of be mindful of. We also included in our program of study for finance and business, the idea of like supply chain and logistics. Uh, kind of in some of our roles because that is kind of a burgeoning and a strength of Illinois kind of economy as well. And of course, there's always roles in accounting, whether it be in terms of like AAS roles or the ones that are transferable as well. And you can see here kind of the variance of the um, <clears throat> the wages and stuff. You see here a human resources ass assistant was kind of included, even though it's kind of significantly below and similarly with bookkeeping clerks. The reason why these were included, these roles, and despite the fact that they're low wage scale relative to the living wage, is that we believed and the advisory committee believed that those roles could build or stack to the higher earning roles through kind of more education. So that's why it was something that we felt still should be included. 
At the post-secondary level, you'll see here kind of a, a parallel of like of a guided transfer opportunity where you, a student can go to a local community college, get their AA in accounting, business, actuary, things of that nature, and transfer that to a bachelor's degree, bachelor's of science or bachelor's of arts at almost all Illinois universities. In the business kind of uh, sector of programs at the community college, there were a lot of kind of AAS programs. And, you know, I must make note that a lot of the AAS programs in many community colleges had then further specializations, right? You could kind of through your electives or through your courses emphasize entrepreneurship, hospitality, human resources, insurance, management, marketing, so on and so forth, right? So that we did want to kind of make sure that the AAS category in business also had a lot of kind of more subspecification at the community college level. And you'll see here kind of some of our supply chain roles. We felt that the one that really rose most valuable or kind of rolled up to the most kind of occupations with the AAS and the accounting AAS. And what we found and where a lot of our advisory committee said is that all those term normally thought of as terminal degrees is in the AAS did have a significant um, feasibility or like easiness to transfer to a bachelor's degree at either select universities or most universities throughout the state. One final note here at the bottom right, uh, kind of unique to this program of study is this notion of supporting certifications. There is a lot of industry credentials that you can earn in business, such as like in QuickBooks, Microsoft Excel, Tableau, so on and so forth. What our kind of advisory committee felt is that those certifications are nice to have and typically are generally incorporated or should be or should be integrated into kind of the courses that a student might take at the community college level, but that these certifications alone wouldn't get you the role or the, the occupation that you were desired, right? There's still a lot of screening from the HR industry, our screening around degrees and prior experience, and that certifications are not as valued as high on by employers as kind of what individuals value them on their resume. So some of the themes of our advisory committee but we didn't want to disregard or dismiss them entirely. Now we see here kind of the course sequences and the model program study for uh, finance and business services. Well, uh, kind of our pathway starts kind of pretty similar with uh, like many others, or a common set of courses, right? This computer applications for business course uh, is something that is like offered in many kind of community colleges. It's an IAI transferable course. It has very low student kind of eligibility requirements. So it's very, very accessible, even as early as sophomore year of high school. If And we recommend folks try to do that and overlap that significantly with the CTE kind of ISB course matrix. We also recommend that kind of an intro to business course, which is pretty much offered at all community colleges also overlaps with the ISB secondary uh, CT matrix, but we do recommend if students, if that can be offered through a unique partnership with your community college as dual credit or dual enrollment, we really encourage that as well. In the skill development phase, what we saw, we made a recommendation uh, for entrepreneurship as a dual credit course. What that actually reflects is the following, right? There's an increasing amount of access to or programming throughout the state at the high school level around these courses around entrepreneurship, right? These experiences like such as Incubator or the Midland Institute CEO program, right? These courses are really good about drawing in student attention to kind of the career area of finance and business. It makes them excited about learning more and they're not as dry as maybe something like accounting might be, right? So we really encourage in our program of study, encourage secondary districts to seek out those entrepreneurship programs, and if possible, and it has been started to be done in various areas across the state, overlap those experiences with a dual credit partnership with your local community college. For those uh, districts that didn't have those entrepreneurship experiences, uh, some of our kind of colleagues at me highly recommended this notion of like, okay, you should definitely be introducing students to a management or marketing type course. In this case, we settled on management and kind of included marketing later. Where this kind of program of study really splits is at the kind of capstone experience, right? Students who have the math capable, you know, financial accounting, you know, I've talked to this many people, financial accounting and finance and business is the most important course. And is if anyone wants to major, graduate with a degree or certificate in finance and business, they will never be able to avoid the financial accounting course. That's at the community college level, at the university level, it's transferable, but it has higher than average math student eligibility uh, requirements. So it's difficult to kind of for students to access in high school, right? So 
what we've made a suggestion is that if a student is able to have the math capability to place into that course at senior year, they should attempt to do so. But if not, there are these other options like intro to management, intro to marketing, business law, which are offered by most almost all community colleges. They have an overlap with the CTSB course matrix and SIP codes, so we recommend those options as well. Financial accounting as well, because of the higher, uh, not only does it have student, high student eligibility requirements, but a higher kind of teacher credentialing to be able to teach it as dual credit. So we were not shy about mentioning that if this course can be accessed for dual enrollment, now in the area of hybrid or kind of asynchronous education, we uh, encourage that as well. And at the post-secondary level, we really encourage students to then in the financial accounting role and the business finance and accounting role to then move on to managerial account and talenting, which is the complementary course. You see here in the freshman year of college for students, I included financial accounting again. Once again, to emphasize that that course is unavailable, students must go through that course at some point in time. So they either have to go in high school their senior year, or they're going to have to go through it their freshman year. Uh, this is kind of our recommendations for general education courses. One thing that I will make a particular note here is we uh, microeconomics and macroeconomics courses are very, very valuable to the finance and business sector, but they're in the college space, they're normally thought of as social science courses. So we recommend students try to take these courses, their senior year as a capstone experience, either as an AP course or the AP exam or the dual credit option. And you'll see here, we broke down kind of we make parallel math trajectories for students in each of these pathways based on kind of their math accountability and kind of align that with the career focus courses as well. So for example, students who were on the business finance and accounting track and were placing into financial accounting their senior year needed to be placing or already passing kind of college algebra calculus and statistics by the senior year. And for students who were maybe in more the management or marketing track, that we provided options that if they weren't already in dual credit or early college math courses, they should maybe think about these transitional courses, placing them into STEM and quantitative careers. One last thing that I'll mention here is that our advisory committee felt that there's an overemphasis in finance and business on calculus and that statistics is equally or of important value and generally in the finance and business sector. So just wanted to show that we were always kind of valuing both at the post-secondary level. My final key cape to weeks is that, you know, bachelor's degree is really important in this space, but there are some regional supervisory roles with an AES that are still applicable and transferable. This pathway has a lot of early college opportunities, and a lot of those uh, potential early college opportunities overlap with ISB SIP codes, they overlap with AP exams, so we really feel that there's an opportunity for students to earn early college credit through some kind of determination by the local secondary district. Once again, my point about the importance of financial accounting of this course, and students, when designing a pathway from a secondary perspective, you really should be preparing students to take that course by their senior year or by their freshman year of high uh, college, right? And in preparing them to be ready to do that is really kind of benefit the student most uh, the most by the time they enroll at the post-secondary level. My final note here about the kind of the entrepreneurship program and kind of how enticing it is to student and trying to see if you can kind of partner with a college to offer that for dual credit or dual enrollment or what have you. And of course, in, in our program, the course entrepreneurship and intro to business were selected for competency development because they were pretty common and nearly universal among all community colleges and but were not already II courses as well. We will conclude here with the process for public comments. So ICCB and its systems invite everyone. A lot of you, your comments in the chat box have also kind of been noted, but like we invite all of you to kind of leave robust public comment on our website through our survey, kind of with the link there as you see it. We will be collecting this, uh, this information through June 5th. And not only do we invite you to kind of submit public comment, but please encourage your colleagues at the secondary, post-secondary and or employer partners to do so. On our website, we really, for each kind of sector, we included a visual, but we also like a 20 page guide. We really ask that you kind of look at that guide first because we explain a lot of our reasoning there and kind of, and having read that, then a comment as well, because I think sometimes some of those questions are pre-answered through that method. All right, without further ado, we thank you all very much. We really appreciate your, your help and kind of this has been kind of a 
great labor of love for us. And we, for those of you who kind of were joining us, who were on our advisory committee, we give double thanks to you all kind of to being willing to handle our hour and a half long to two hour long kind of webinar sessions and debates. So with our advisory committee, so we really appreciate your work with that as well. Thank you all. Thank you all.